Good morning and welcome to M12's inaugural industry summit. We're delighted to have you all. Thank you for joining us for a session we're calling Future Proofing the Enterprise. I'm Tanya Lowe. I'm a market development lead for M12, Microsoft's corporate venture capital arm. And for today's agenda, we'll start with a quick overview of who we are as M12 before digging into a stimulating panel discussion with our experts here. We have Robert Locke, who's a senior vice president of corporate development from Johnson Controls. We have Dave Petrucci, industry strategy leader from Microsoft, and Samir Kumar, our managing director and GM of M12. After that, we'll get into a startup showcase featuring not one, not two, not three, but six exciting companies from the M12 portfolio. These are incredible startups that we are so honored to be a part of their stories. All right, so who is M12? First of all, we're investing in innovation globally. And by global, I mean global. So last time I counted, we're in uh, 100 companies plus in about 11 countries. We have offices in five different locations. So in North America, we're headquartered in Seattle and San Francisco. We have a team in Israel, just outside of Tel Aviv. And then we have a partner in India looking after Asia and India investments and a team member in London looking after Europe. Our mission is pretty clear. We're looking to empower the best B2B entrepreneurs with capital, customer connections, and unparalleled ac access to Microsoft. We're about five years old. As I mentioned, we have over 100 companies and about 85 active. So we've had 17 exits to date. Uh, in terms of our investment focus, this is where we are a little bit different from most corporate venture capital arms. Instead of being strategic in nature in, in investing in companies that will be advantageous to the parent company, we're actually more financially focused. So we're looking for really strong, unique companies that are independently creating their own intellectual property and have a robust approach to a new innovative uh, technology that will transform markets. We invest in almost exclusively B2B software, so enterprise software as a service companies, and occasionally we'll do a hardware investment where software is the point of leverage. When we think about the companies we want to invest in, we're really looking at companies we can accelerate. They don't have to be on the Azure platform to start. That is definitely not a requirement. We're platform agnostic, which also tends to surprise people. But we also do not require them to migrate or extend onto the Microsoft platform. However, many of our companies do because they see the benefits in working with Microsoft. From a funding standpoint, our sweet spot is primarily Series A and B investments. We do try to follow on as far as we can with pro rata into Series C and later stages. We do a select number of seed investments, typically through some of the innovative uh, female founders competitions we've led. And in terms of our check sizes, they range from about one to 20 million. Our focus areas are these main five angles. So applied AI and big data, business applications that are driving modern workforce transformation, all sorts of infrastructure and DevOps plays, as well as a very deep security bench that's led by our GM in Israel, Moni Hasid. As far as Vanguard bets, these are the paradigm shifting technologies that we believe will really transform um, whole markets and change the way we work and live. So that can be everything from applied quantum to additive manufacturing to drone airspace management, for example. This slide just gives you a quick glimpse into the many companies that we're delighted to also support as M12. Um, you might know some of these brands like Outreach, which is the number one sales engagement platform, Workboard, which drives strategic OKR alignment across many enterprise organizations, Pachyderm, which is like a Git for uh, version controlling data, and then our security bench, which we would be delighted to share with you. If you are interested at all in any of our companies, please definitely visit our website. It's www.m12.vc. Find us on Twitter. It's at M12VC, LinkedIn, or feel free to reach out to us directly. 
In terms of our team structure, so we're uniquely built to support our companies uh, so that they can succeed. So in addition to our investors who are scouring the planet for the best companies and teams to back and then joining portfolio company boards to help those companies grow, we have our portfolio development team, which builds custom roadmaps with each and every company so that our companies know when they join the Emtral portfolio, what are the product uh, partnerships and integrations they should be considering? How could they possibly sell into key Microsoft teams or sell with our broader field organization? And then what other programmatic benefits can they leverage, whether it's Azure credits or LinkedIn perks? Market development is my arena. It's where we're looking to partner with global customers, the Fortune 500, as well as Global 2000 and other leading technology companies to really understand their priorities and problems and then curate, match, make our companies uh, to help solve those problems. And if we can't, then we take the gaps and insights. We share them back with our team and with Microsoft to really help further and inform the way we invest um, so we could do that smarter and better. Uh, one other thing that market development does is partner with a number of great VC funds, uh, which I'll cover in a second. Finally, we have our strategy and research team, which was originally designed to help with technical diligence, but has quickly evolved to providing much more of investment theses and guidance in looking at where M12 should be headed from a horizon two, three envisioning standpoint, really exploring what markets we should be entering and what is the signal that is critical to M12 as well as our broader Microsoft decision makers. The other ways we support our companies include the M12 Advisory Board. So this is a really extraordinary group of experts who have deep subject matter expertise in everything from quantum to DevOps and open source uh, to AI at scale, modern learning and design, and of course, cybersecurity. I'd like to really highlight Jocelyn Moore, who is a global practice leader in diversity and inclusion. She's actually been working with many of our portfolio companies to ensure that they're hiring and retaining very inclusive teams and have a, a true DEI policy. We also have this M12 Expert Network, which is meant to really recruit the top performing talent across Microsoft and give them a taste of what it is to help a startup grow while helping our companies access that expert professionals um, insights and intelligence in terms of specific projects that they might want to adapt to campaigns in order to grow their companies. Mm -hmm. So this is another way that we engage Microsoft in helping our companies succeed. Lastly, I wanted to spend a few minutes just focusing in on a key component of M12, which is that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a really important pillar to us as a fund. So in building on Microsoft's commitment, a lot of what we do with M12 is we think about not only how do we attract and retain a diverse, a diverse group of people, uh, but how can we help our portfolio companies utilize tools and expertise to ensure they're maintaining very diverse teams? And then how do we impact and work with the right players in the ecosystem who are like-minded and thinking we should leave this ecosystem better than how we found it? So going back to what market development does on the VC partner side, this gives you a snapshot of the seed stage and diversity mandated partners we work with. Uh, about nine of these have a specific underrepresented minority mandate in terms of backing uh, underserved populations that are out there building great businesses. Um, finally, we've done a couple of great female founders competitions that have deployed a total of 10 million in capital into six enterprise companies that um, are founded by women. We be Cecilia Flores will be presenting today. We're very excited for that. Lastly, this is the ecosystem of some nonprofits and other groups that we work with that are supporting women in tech, as well as the, you know, improving the number of VCs that are female to black and brown founders. We could go on and on. So again, please visit our website so if you'd like to learn more about how we not just think about backing our companies, but also work with the broader ecosystem at large. At this point, I think we're ready for the panel discussion. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Robert Block. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Robert. Could you share a bit about your background and as we kick off our panel. Yeah, thank you, um, Robert Locke, uh, Senior VP of Corporate Development for Johnson Controls. I uh, joined Johnson Controls with the acquisition of a startup where I was CEO. I've been the uh, founder and or CEO of five startups and uh, also worked in uh, 
corporate environment a number of times, starting my career at IBM, having been a venture partner at JP Morgan Capital and now at Johnson Controls. My uh, responsibilities include the corporate venture capital initiatives for Johns Controls, also the uh, new business creation initiative to uh, to leverage the uh, the ability to create new businesses with a growth board inside of Johns Controls, which acts very much like an internal VC. And I spend a lot of time with customers. I'm the executive sponsor for JCI on uh, Microsoft and a number of other companies. Thank you, Robert. Clearly, you have this multi-sides of the table view. So we're excited to dig into that. Um, next, we have Dave Petrucci. Thanks, Dave, for joining us. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Tanya. Dave Petrucci and I lead our business strategy for our manufacturing industry. And, and again, uh, my, my background leads from early years of industry uh, into you know, technology and consulting over the years. Um, in the current role leading business strategy, the focus is really, as a company, how do we start pivoting from just being a technology company to being an industry-focused company, helping our customers solve uh, deep and complex problems and, and bringing the right portfolio and bringing the right ecosystem of partners together um, to be able to do that for, for our customers. And, you know, JCI is one of those unique uh, I'll say customer slash partners uh, in our world that uh, we we enjoy working with on a day to day basis, solving really, really challenging problems for our customers. Thank you, David. And then we'll bring it over to Samir, who will be our moderator today for our panel. So after the introduction, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Samir Kumar, Managing Director, of GM and M12, based in San Francisco. Um, I lead our uh, Vanguard Vets, which are generational shifts in technology uh, investments in startups, and also providing technical stewardship for the fund as a whole, uh, all deep tech, frontier tech, but where software is a point of leverage. I consider myself a technologist at heart first and investor second, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today with uh, Robert and David. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. And, uh, you know, maybe just as a as a kind of a uh, opening question. Here we are in June of 2021, uh, coming up on 18 months since COVID started. And I certainly didn't expect 18 months later we would be doing an event like this still remotely. Uh, so certainly I think this uh, this event that we're all dealing with has, uh, you know, far exceeded any expectations or, uh, you know, when this would, how long this would last or when we would come out of it. So maybe I would just like to start with asking both of you as you reflect on COVID and whether it's in manufacturing or your respective roles or, uh, in, the or in the case of Robert at Johnson Controls, what's been the most you know, startling realization that you've had about COVID? And maybe we'll start with you, Robert, and if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say the, the most uh, startling thing was the acceleration of adoption of technologies that were driven by the impact of COVID. And the uh, the best example I can think of was the the overnight adoption of Teams, for example, at Johns Controls. Uh, one day we were meeting in person, and uh, the next day we decided that travel was completely shut down. We were going to go completely to Teams, and three or four days later, it was simply the way we did business, which we never would have had, have believed. Uh, George Oliver, our CEO, made the observation a couple months later that if we had planned to stop all travel and move to a complete Teams environment for all meetings, internal and external, it probably would have taken over a year and we would have had a big uh, change management effort. And in this case, we just said we're going to do it and we did it and it happened. Uh, I've also seen a, a significant change in the needs of our customers as customers uh, put together plans to keep their employees safe while running their businesses. So it was really an interesting uh, time and a lot of challenges. And it was, uh, I thought, remarkable the way that uh, that all of the com uh, the companies, uh, both our customers and Johns Controls and our partners, reacted to this and uh, and did it so well. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. I think you know whether it's in manufacturing or other industries, and even internally at Microsoft, the adoption of Teams and the usage of Teams and the, the, the sharp spike that's seen since the beginning of COVID is, I think, 
to some extent surprising to all of us and and, and it's been a great catalyst. Um, David, as you think about the customers that you've engaged with in the manufacturing sector, you know, taking a more kind of across customer view, what's what's surprised you the most? Well, you know, you thought during a pandemic spending would be shut down, you know, uh, innovation would be shut down. And, and it's been just the opposite, really. Most companies have used this as an opportunity to accelerate. Uh, if you think about uh, supply chain and the fact that the whole supply chain got turned upside down in a matter of uh, two months and thinking, you know, allowing companies to rethink their supply chain, not just from a movement of goods, but a generation of goods. And how does that apply to maybe creating more um, agile and, and uh, autonomous types of facilities? Because what we found was that the labor market actually was very challenging during this time, and it was already challenging going into the pandemic, but it became more challenging in the, in the pandemic. And so companies are having to think about how to do you know, the same or more work with different um, resource models. And so many of those cases are talking about uh, automation and AI and actually leveraging those in operational environments today. And I think coming out of this, uh, what's been interesting is where most companies wouldn't think about really turning on autonomous environments and AI environments uh, in a production world. Uh, it's now becoming the reality and it's, it's you almost are forced to, to do it, uh, to be able to keep up with, uh, with the demand. So I think it's really been about the innovation and, and technology adoption during this time more than anything. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, certainly this has been a catalyst for adopting new technologies, but also, I guess, a level of resilience in just you have to adapt um, and and be able to adjust to this new normal. Um, now, I'd be curious, David, if you think about what things are maybe started in COVID, but will see persist even when we go back to some sort of normal. Uh, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think if you think about the whole product development and innovation cycle, um, this was always a very centralized process uh, inside the four walls of a building. And what was really, you know, forced was how do we do product development in a remote model? How do we, you know, how do we continue to move forward? Because product innovation became actually a major factor during the pandemic. I, I don't see that going away. I think this has opened up new doors, um, new trust models, new collaboration models uh, that are allowing that to not just continue, but actually accelerate. Um, I think that's one area. I think the from a supply chain standpoint of, do we need to rethink where our manufacturing facilities are? Uh, where, how do we get you know, the right raw materials? How do we put plants closer to where the need is? Um, and not doing that at just at a higher cost, um, in more reliable supply chain, but doing it in a cost-effective supply chain model. So I think those are the things that you'll continue to see as we move forward. Great, great points. Uh, and, and Robert, coming back to Johnson Controls, so certainly, you know, as, as both you and David mentioned, uh, you know, the, the kind of the changes that have happened during COVID, the acceleration of, you know, trying new things, uh, being resilient and adopting new technologies. But Johnson Controls is an established 135 year old company, um, I'm sure, and given your experience, both as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and now leading corporate development, there has to be, you know, it's not like things are completely frictionless, like we can just try new things and, you know, th there's no hurdles or impediments there. But what, are, what, what kind of internal hurdles do you face in uh, trying out new things, bringing in technologies from the outside and new innovations that you have to overcome to see success there? Yeah, I, I don't really see it in terms of needing to overcome it because we have a, um, a leadership team in place across the company which really embraces this challenge. And, and our focus is really on starting with the customer. Uh, so rather than, than do it the old way of meeting in conference rooms in different places and coming up with a solution, bringing it to market, we're very focused on trying to get out there and understand exactly what the customer needs are. This is especially important 
in a time of great change, like right now with COVID, where the customer's needs have changed dramatically. So we start with the customer, we try to understand their needs, and then work backward from there to enabling technology in terms of what do we need to do to solve those problems. There's a real focus. I noticed the the M12 is focus, a fund is focused on uh, the application of AI to solve problems. Uh, but we, we try not to start there. We try to start with the customers uh, and work backwards from there. And then there's also the challenge of of uh, working through a non not invented here technology. And that really, if a company is going to be successful, we really need to leave that behind and embrace the concept, not only of open innovation, where we look for partners like Microsoft, who's been a great partner in this regard uh, to help us solve problems, but really reaching out uh, to customers and, and embracing uh, relationships with customers and collaboration with customers and going to customers and not saying, you know, we have something to sell or we have something we want you to try, but going to customers and saying, you know, there's new challenges here and there's new ways to address those challenges and let's work together and let's figure it out together. And and I see real opportunity there to uh, to bring that collaborative mindset uh, to the marketplace and to customers who really appreciate it. Thank you. And yeah, I think the NIH, the three letter acronym uh, for not invented here, I'm curious, you know, this is something I think big companies in general deal with. Yeah. Have you seen a kind of a, a uh, ability to dampen that a little bit because of the pressures of COVID? Um, or is it, hey, this is, this is the case, whether COVID or no COVID and, you know, how you deal with it isn't really different? I think it was, it was a challenge before and we were, to be honest, effectively uh, addressing the challenge and, and it really had a concerted effort to do that. I think COVID uh, accelerated the need to do that because the customers were looking for solutions right now to a problem that existed right now, which goes back to that acceleration of adoption of technologies. And the traditional ways of building things in house and taking years to do it just doesn't cut it. So the mindset shift also gets accelerated to how do we solve this problem? Who's got a solution to the problem? Who can we partner with? And how can we how can we quickly get a solution to the market to address our customers' needs? And the companies that are nimble and are able to make those changes in the way they operate and get to market quickly with solutions which effectively meet customer needs, I think are are proving to be the winners in this environment. Yeah. And and maybe just kind of continuing on that theme, David, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, these these significant changes like automation, uh, you know, thinking about supply chains in a in a more resilient way. But you know, similar to what Robert pointed out, how do you what kind of process mind shift changes have you seen amongst the customers that you're interacting with in the manufacturing space? Hey, you know, let's let's think about the Fortune 2000, and you know they're all risk adverse companies, right? And they've put policy and procedure in place over the years to to create a you know a secure and and uh, risk adverse type of environment. And so I think part of this is thinking about the policy changes, the procurement changes that have to go through the process to open up the doors and. You know, we're not Microsoft is not a 135 year old company, but, you know, we're still a large, mm -hmm. I'll say, established company. And we ourselves have trouble sometimes on how do we consume new technology, new innovation that's coming from the startup community. And so, you know, this is an all size problem. And I think the pandemic has really opened up. How do we need to rethink our policies and procedures to be able to consume some of these new capabilities with a little bit higher risk tolerance because um, for us to move forward quickly, you know, there is a level of risk that we all need to identify and consume, you know, be able to consume and, and manage, right? And it's not just going in blinded with risk, but being able to manage that risk as we work through it. So I think those are the, the kind of the policy and procedure changes that, that companies need to think about as we go forward. Right, right. And so, you know, at a high level, this all makes sense, sounds great, but Robert, you, you're living it on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we think about implementing you know, new strategies, uh, measuring the, the benefits of uh, bringing in innovation, whether it's from the outside or homegrown, you know, ultimately, what are the, the KPIs? What, how do you do this in a tangible, measurable way and, and make this real? Like, how, how is that happening at Johnson Controls? 
You know, it's it's interesting because when I when I first uh, you know kind of embraced the challenge of working with a company to to do this kind of thing, uh, we tried to do it in terms of putting together presentations and talking about the uh, the right way to change the way we operate and and uh, create new businesses and compete with startups is to be bold and to be embrace risk and to move fast and you can't really communicate you can't really um, have an impact on a business by doing powerpoints to be honest and what we've found is the most effective way to change behaviors and actually change the the culture of the company is experiential learning and by that i mean uh, we've had a couple of um, a couple of acquisitions recently qualsys which is a uh, a startup uh, that uh, we invested in a number of years ago and finally acquired last year uh, bringing the qualsys team in and giving them a, a broader portfolio to manage and then watching the qualsys team uh, work the way that they do work and and taking the perspective that we're going to learn from them, that we acquired them not only because they have products which are leaders in the market, but because they have behaviors and a culture and, a, and an ability to move fast and be bold, which, which allowed them to grow and become a great company as an independent company. And we need to find a way to listen to them and learn from them uh, to uh, to Im imbue our culture with that kind of behavior. And that's actually working remarkably well. And people are now, you know, we saw it in our organizational help numbers. We had, you know, we had pretty good numbers to start with, but when Dave Pulling, the CEO of that company came in and took over that business, the numbers went off the chart because people really want to do great work and they want to move fast and they want to be bold and they want to embrace risk. We also have another acquisition we did recently, Silent Air, which is in the, data center cooling business. And uh, and we on that one, we've also embraced uh, a, uh, a process of learning from them. They're doing a great job. Microsoft is one of their, their very good customers. And, uh, and the mindset, instead of the traditional mindset for industrial companies and 135 year old companies like ours, that we're gonna do an acquisition and we're gonna teach them how to do business the way we do it. We, we have very much a, a, a more humble approach to be honest and say, they're doing it great. They're growing rapidly. They're a, they're a market leader. We're going to learn from them. We're going to understand how they behave, how they interact with customers, how they collaborate with customers. And uh, and what I've seen, uh, going back to that experiential point, is that it's much easier for people to really understand the benefits and change their behaviors when they see it and they feel it and they see the results inside of our own business. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point, which is if you're doing acquisitions, you know, absorb the culture uh, and the best practices of the companies you're acquiring and infuse that into the global company culture uh, to do it better. I think that's a, that's a really important point. I think it's true for, it should be true for any large company uh, that's in, uh, it's acquisitive and doing M&A. Um, when we think about, you know, things that can impact the success, whether it's integrating an acquisition, adopting new technology, you know, clearly there are some factors that can, you know, make it, you know, work really well or could be uh, an impediment. Um, David, as you think about things like change manage management in the manufacturing space, and certainly things like this new trend around additive manufacturing, what are you, what are you seeing there? Like when, when is it able to work well versus when do teams struggle uh, with implementing things like additive manufacturing? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. And I think one of the luxuries of my job is that I get to talk to so many companies that are doing innovative pieces of work. And, and I had a story uh, not too long ago about uh, a large automotive company that had engaged in additive, manu <clears throat> excuse me, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, but actually production 3D printing for parts in vehicle. And, uh, you know, they, they funded the first project, uh, made it cost effective uh, to be in vehicle, ran the program. And as they were looking at moving to the next program, one of the things that they were challenged with was actually really keeping this at a cost competitive model. And when you think about technology adoption, you know, I started asking the questions of, you know, if you were able to do it once, why can't you do that in a repetitive fashion? And, mm -hmm. and the question, the, the answer, the response was that, you know, our, our traditional supply chains are continuing to reduce cost and become more competitive. And what we found was, our designers actually 
weren't able to really design for the technology, right? So they weren't able to leverage, you know, certain uh, geometries. They weren't able to understand, um, you know, the uh, the cooling methods related to, uh, the, you know, using 3D printing. And so it's one of those things where you think about change management, you think about bringing in these new technologies, but sometimes you don't think about the, the whole ecosystem that participates in that new technology and enabling them to be, to leverage that new technology. And so, you know, if you think about 3D printing, you think about being able to leverage uh, new design capabilities and make it cost effective, it should be there. And by the way, you know, this company has kicked off a massive uh, enablement program to, to help those designers learn the new technologies learn what can be done with it and how to think differently about the design. And I think that's the thing as we go forward with the innovation is, let's not just use the traditional practices that we've we've had in the past. Let's really think about how to leverage new technology in a different way uh, and create new processes, new methods for how we're actually leveraging it. Yeah, so I think this is another really good point, which is in order to benefit from the promise of a new technology or new innovation, you really have to map it to an effective process in your company. Otherwise, like, you know, Robert was pointing out, PowerPoints are great, ideas are great, but you're not going to be able to realize them in, in actuality. So Robert, in, in, in the same vein, if you think about AI and, you know, clearly there's a lot of promise about the applications of AI in manufacturing, revolutionizing manufacturing, but we know that, you know, cool demos and, and great mm -hmm. papers or great ideas, but again, how do you internalize that? How do you make it real for your company? What, what, what's been your experience with, let's say, looking at uh, adopting AI technologies and in Johnson Controls, what's the reality there? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question because uh, while AI has, uh, has been around for many years, uh, there, there are, uh, there are places where it really works well and has the ability to scale and transform a business and have a huge impact. And there are also areas which are really compelling, but they're at to your point at that kind of research paper uh, position, or they might work very well in the lab, but when you get them out in the field, right. uh, they, they don't really work as well as they do in the lab because there's, there's elements in the environment that were unanticipated. Uh, so I would say two things, one, we're very focused on trying to find places where AI, for example, is mature enough to have an impact today and go solve customer problems today and do it at scale. Uh, having said that, uh, the only way to find that out once you do the homework and, and uh, make a decision you think you've got something is to, is to get out in the field and do it. And I think it's really important here that one of the differentiating factors that, that uh, distinguishes successful companies in these kinds of pursuits from the ones that aren't, is you gotta get out of the conference room, you gotta make a decision at some point, you gotta get out in the field with your customers or in your own factories, and you gotta try it out and see what works and what doesn't work. And then if it doesn't work, then you learn, you pivot, you try again. But that orientation towards action, that doing, that getting out in the field is, is so important. And I think it's one of the fundamental things that distinguishes not only startups from more mature companies who aren't able to innovate effectively, but it distinguishes the leaders in the field who can do it at scale, the companies like the Microsofts of the world and the Amazons and the Googles and the Facebooks and the, and the uh, Teslas to, uh, to get out there and just try things that, that look like they're crazy, but, uh, but ultimately uh, at times that's where the breakthroughs come from. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a good piece of advice. You just you know, get out of the conference room, get with the customer, get on the plant floor, see what works, uh, yeah. and make it real. Um, and I think this is an interesting point because as you look at AI in the enterprise, you know, despite the promise of AI across the enterprise in many different areas, today what we're seeing is uh, RPA, robot process automation, is the leading use case. And mm -hmm. if you look at what's under RPA, it's really kind of automating menial repetitive tasks. And the fact that that can work and enterprises can extract value from it is why that is becoming or has become the dominant use case for AI technologies in the enterprise today. Now, when we think about manufacturing, I'd be interested in hearing from both of you, 
what's the equivalent of you know something that is truly having an impact similar to RPAs at a, at a horizontal level, but in the manufacturing space? And you know, you could touch on is it computer vision? Is it AI at the edge? Is it AI and IoT? You know, just an open question. And maybe David, as you as you talk to lots of different customers, what are you, what are you seeing there? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, I think quality had been lost for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, it, it just, you know, was never on the number one list. Uh, and what we've seen is this rebirth of quality, you know, from a product standpoint, a manufacturing standpoint. And, you know, computer vision has become such a key piece of that from an inspection and quality assurance standpoint. Um, you know, we, I grew up in the quality uh, environment at Honda, and, and we always said, you know, visual inspection was at best 70% accurate uh, from an employee standpoint, and so you were always at risk. Um, and so being able to bring, you know, these types of technologies in that, you know, can be very, very specific to paint defect, to wiring harness, you know, uh, you know quality, um, the things that are being done with with computer vision and from a safety standpoint as well is is really amazing and we just see it continuing to explode uh, every customer conversation i have on a plant floor that is the number one topic right now is how do we better leverage ai technologies related to quality so that we can improve first pass yield and actually reduce our operating costs and improve customer satisfaction especially with the labor market the way it is right now this is a huge item got it got it um, Robert, so AI at the edge is a topic I'm personally quite passionate about, and especially AI at the tiny edge and IoT. And you can certainly imagine that being quite relevant to things like plant floors and in manufacturing. But again, it sounds great. It, the promise is amazing. But you tell me, what's the reality? What What is it like at Johnson Controls today? Where are you in your journey around AI at the edge? And, and what does that mean for your business? Well, I, I'd like to make one more comment on what David just said on manufacturing, because I, I want to you know, agree with it and, and extend it a little further. Uh, I think computer vision is, is probably the best example in my experience for relevant technologies to Johns Controls for uh, a, a, an element of AI, which is mature and making a big difference. And the manufacturing side, there's the opportunity uh, to uh, take a situation where you might have a hundred different plants, which were all the product of a number of different acquisitions, which aren't integrated. Integrated, and uh, and and computer vision actually has the ability to, at some level, see what's happening in the plant. So the the requirement to integrate systems and to exchange data is alleviated to a certain point when you have you know a video camera that actually can see what's going on, and you don't have to extract the data. Uh, and it's really a, a, an enormously powerful tool that I think we're just just now getting our arms around, our minds around exactly what we can do with it. And on the product, you know, David meant, uh, mentioned the expansion, the uh, the inspection, but there's also the ability to watch how a product is made, watch what processes are used, watch if somebody's doing something that's not compliant, and then and then uh, come back uh, and correlate later what the what the uh, what the quality was and the performance of that product in the field to the way it was actually manufactured step by step. So it's really an exciting area. And with regard to your question, edge computing, I think it's edge computing is moving very quickly. It's it's very powerful. And uh, and as you as you as you adopt technologies like computer and vision in the field, uh, the requirement to to move that processing out to the edge and to be able to do things there is is an enabling factor in, in kind of an explosion of capability at the edge. I'll take video, for example. The best example is probably consumer video. If you go on Amazon today for a very low price from almost any vendor, you can you can buy video cameras and put them up in your house that have you know, real AI and computer vision capability in your home with processing at the edge. So I think we're, uh, we're, we're at the point where it really does work today and it's accelerating rapidly. And I think you're going to see some pretty amazing things happen with edge computing in the not too distant future. Yeah. And, and, and just adding on to that, Samir, um, I think this is a key thing. I think the concept of you know predictive maintenance and all of these topics that have been out there that were 
always let's take some information, send it back to central compute, you know, do some analysis in not real time, and then apply some new models, you know, to the plants. I think that was okay. I, I think the real adoption becomes when you really can do that edge level analysis and compute in real time. And that's what really drives change to the manufacturing world. And we, we've always had some limitations from a uh, edge compute storage, you know, processing capability, uh, but that's really being driven down now uh, to, to where it is reality. And, and we're seeing such a large adoption to really autonomous, you know, manufacturing capabilities now where they're turning off operators and turning on the technology. Th th this is really exciting to see. Now, that's, that's really great to hear from both of you. It's actually music to my ears, uh, both because I'm passionate about this area, but as an investor, you know, the combination of computer vision and AI at the edge, I think you're, you're both making a really important point, which is the ability to now use these technologies to generate the analytics from the physical world that can then feed into optimizing processes, being able to actually deliver on the idea of predictive uh, capabilities. And I think, it, and also doing it in a, privacy preserving way in a performant way with having uh, both computer vision and AI running at the edge. So that's a, you know, it's again, very, very exciting to see that and hearing that from uh, industry leaders like yourself. So, so if, you, uh, if, if you put edge computing capability as it grows and gets even more powerful and you combine that at some level, at some point with some level of general intelligence in the field, then you can take this sensory input and at the edge, you can do anomaly detection and you don't actually have to do the explicit training for solving a specific problem. At some point, the AI at the edge is going to be able to say, hey, there's there's something different going on here and raise its hand and say, you might want to take a look at this. So I think the the power going forward and, and the opportunity to leverage, you know, the compute at the edge is really combined with the evolving, you know, capability of AI is really extraordinary. Yeah. No, I think, again, music to my ears to hear you say that. So that's fantastic. Um, you know, before we jump into any questions from the audience, maybe kind of closing thoughts from both of you as you think about, you know, based on your own journey, what you're seeing with customers, what you're seeing in your own company, what advice would you have, um, you know, in terms of embracing risk and flexibility? And Robert, I'll start with you because you had a really fascinating anecdote about a bunch of students and four hundred dollars in parts from Amazon. So please tell us about that. Yeah, well, that's interesting because we're talking about edge computing, and we were, you know, you know, you can add in, uh, you know, five G and all kinds of elements. But at the other end of the spectrum is the is the example we were talking about, where we have a customer. In this case, it was Microsoft that had a challenge, and I hired uh, four three. Uh, full stack developer interns who are graduate students at different universities around the country and gave them the problem. And they came back and said, we need some hardware to uh, solve that problem. So I bought a total of, I think, $420 in parts, Arduinos and things like that from Amazon and uh, gave them to them. And they they actually came back with a, a solution to the problem and we presented it, they presented it to the customer and who said, wow, you actually did this. Uh, can you go do this next level? And then they went back and did that. And it was really an interesting <clears throat> exercise in the fact that on one hand, we can talk about AI at the edge and general intelligence and things like that. On the other hand, we can also talk about some really simple things you can do if you're listening to the customer <clears throat> and paying attention to specific problems. It, it isn't always something that's, <clears throat> that's a game changer at the very leading edge of technology. It might just be something that some students can do. It also acted as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as an on-ramp for some students. We had um, a lot of diverse students in this, and uh, now they all want to work for Johnson Controls, and they want to continue to do this. And they love the experience of working with a customer and taking responsibility and solving a problem. No, that's great. Kind of, it, you know, it's, it's inspiring to hear the story of just kind of hack your way to a solution and some out-of-the-box thinking. And if it works, it also helps with recruiting uh, because those folks would want to come and work for you afterwards. Um, David, maybe just as, as the last thought as you know, this idea of just try it. Uh, what are you seeing with your customers where this actually works? Maybe some uh, sage advice for the audience where, yeah, you should just try it based on what you're seeing. You know, I think we've all been through the, the whole pilot purgatory syndrome, right? And, and 
you know, we get so caught up in proving a technology, whether it works or whether it doesn't, we forget what we're really trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I, I, I go back 10 years when we were first looking at ML and, you know, doing, <clears throat> you know, maybe using libel analysis to predict failures, predict, you know, certain scenarios. And, you know, customers would come back and say, well, the model's only 39% accurate. And, you know, I always start with, uh, well, now you're 39% smarter than you were yesterday, right? And what can you do? Now you 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 can repeatedly take that 39% output and do something with it. And so let's go back to the fundamentals of kind of, you know, lean and, and continuous improvement and say, you know, you're not always going to get to the perfect answer right out of the box. And it goes back to the just go do it type of model yeah. and learn from it, get better, and it will accelerate. And, you know, when you think about some of those old models, you know, it's <laughs> it's interesting to see the um, the trust. And again, where no one trusted the technology 10 years ago, seven years ago, five years ago, now people are learning how to build the trust and say, you know, let's not find every reason to say no. Let's find a reason to say yes and push through. Yeah. And when we do that, I think it's about scale now, right? It's not just proving it once, but it's, you know, and I think yeah. uh, we had a great scenario with, uh, you know, a partner, you know, called Martson and now a part of. Microsoft and, and you know Unilever, where we took some really advanced digital twin technologies, we some very difficult use cases, and we went from one MVP in one facility on one piece of equipment to now across 44 plants, thousands of pieces of equipment, and running full autonomous operations. You know that's what happens when you start building the trust and start finding the reasons to say yes instead of the reasons to say no. No, that's great. And I think this this is a, you know, it's 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 refreshing and inspiring to hear this because obviously this idea of just try it, fail fast, this is the startup ethos. And if we can do more of that in big companies, then I think it's easier to impedance match bringing in innovation from the outside. I want to thank you both for a fantastic conversation. Uh, really enjoyed it and hopefully the audience did as well. And Tanya, I'll turn it over to you for taking some questions from the audience. Absolutely. So thank you all. That was phenomenal. I had one question to start with, which is from someone in the audience. Nitin, thank you for this. How do you overcome issues with brittle AI? So several of you have been bullish about AI. What do you do when you encounter brittle AI? Anyone want to jump at that one? <laughs> I'm happy to take it. It's, yeah, uh... go for it, Samir. Yeah, so I think this is a, a, a to Robert's point, things that work in the lab, and then when you go into the real world, you find reality is different. And I think the nature of the, the kinds of AI models we built today that are data hungry, you really have to focus on being able to generalize better, which means having the right distribution of training data. Um, and if you don't have the right distribution of training data, you will run into brittle AI. You're not gonna be able to work your way around that. So your options are, Either you have the ability to get diversity of training data, and not everyone can do that necessarily. Uh, there are some techniques around being able to get synthetic data to force multiply whatever data you have, or you really have to narrow the use case so that if it is brittle, at least in the scenarios that you are looking at, it works well, but you are fully aware that it is a narrow scenario and it's not gonna be just a, a drop in if you take that AI and drop it into a, into a totally different environment. And still expect you know the same kinds of results. And, and and what's interesting about that, Samir, is a lot of companies, you know, let's let's take automotive and the ADAS community, right? That there just isn't a lot of how do you create every simulation model? How do you create every and and what's been funny is a lot of industry has come to the gaming communities to actually mm -hmm. learn how to create the simulation scenarios. So that you can actually get better training and 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 uh, move forward and get past that brittle scenario. That's right. Yeah, simulation and synthetic data is definitely is a way to deal with that. But it's not a perfect solution, but it definitely helps quite a bit. Thank you both. Um, so I think because of the time, we're just going to go with one more question, which is something we were discussing earlier. So Jean Luc asked regarding the shortage of workers and more specifically AI specialists. 
how does Microsoft help companies develop new business models, leveraging digital technologies? And then how does JCI also sort of handle for this? So I think this goes to some of what we were talking about before with reskilling and labor shortages and how companies can sort of manage for that with people as well as technology. So uh, perhaps we could start with you, David. So I, I think there's a couple layers to that question. One, you know, there's the how do we operate better in our current environments and how do we help, you know, customers identify the opportunities? And, and I think the pandemic really forced some of those discussions. So how do we work smarter with what we have and leverage technology to better do that? You know, some of that's a forcing function. Um, some of that is uh, a longer term, a longer horizon journey. Um, the other layer of that is the innovation side. And, you know, how do we help enable companies to think about what they can do, do different, either with products or processes? You know, we've, you know, I, I think the industrial world has talked about, you know, product as a service for many years. And there's always been challenging, you know, there's always been challenges about bringing that to life. And a lot of that has been technology wise um, of how to bring that to life. And, you know, with the cloud today, it simplifies a lot of that and how to bring the different components together to, you know, move from traditional capital models to OpEx models. Um, you know, there's not one simple answer, but, you know, the way we look at that is, is really what are the enabling technologies and how do we actually work with the customers to, to one, enable their own organizations and processes to, to work through that? Because it's, it's typically their own organizations that are limiting in, you know, those factors. Yeah, the... Uh... The fact is, the questioner is exactly right. The AI talent is concentrated in seven or eight companies. We all know who they are and the startup community. And a mature industrial company is not going to be able to hire the talent, nor should we hire the talent and go build solutions from the ground up. So the challenge we face is to, again, go back to the customer environment, understand what the power of AI is and what works today and what actually has the ability to scale uh, in our customer environments, and then find the right partners to work with to bring that AI capability and leverage Microsoft or one of the other big players who's got that critical mass of talent, and then focus our energy on hiring the people who we can put in place, who can find those right partners, leverage that partner technology, and bring solutions to the market to solve customer problems. Our job is not to build things from scratch. Our job is to go solve customer problems and bring those solutions to, par to market. So it's very much a, a partner scenario and Microsoft is a is one of our great partners in that regard. And, and I think that's key is, and it's not just a partner, it's an ecosystem play these days, right? And and that's what I think's changed the most in the world over the last few years is yeah. how do we play together <laughs> to bring the best possible capabilities to market and do that from a true ecosystem standpoint where it's not one to one, it's not one to two, it's it's truly you know, one to many in, in most cases these days. Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I can't think of a better way to close our panel today is around that open innovation and where that intersects in driving customer obsession and, and success. So thank you all for all of your insights and thoughts. We really appreciate it. Um, I think at this point, we're going to transition into our startup showcase with our first company. Um, so we'll wish you well. Please feel free to stick around if you'd like. Uh, so I'd like to introduce, first of all, Rich Wagner, who's the CEO and founder of Previdere, who will take it away with a presentation on our first company. Thank you. hope everyone can, can see my screen that I'm sharing here as well. And I, I wanted to introduce you to Prepidere, which actually is an Italian verb that means to forecast or to foresee. Uh, and that's that's really how we help companies, especially manufacturing companies. Uh, my background comes from 14 years of leading IT in a in a conglomerate of uh, really companies that were privately held. So I ran IT for about 14 years, implementing technology, hardware systems, data centers. Uh, and then eventually, you know, cloud computing into that environment. But it's there where I saw there was a gap in the market. 
And there was a real gap in our company. And the way that we forecast and plan was really driven by looking at internal historical data only. Um, we, we really didn't have the ability to access external factors, which were actually true drivers of our business performance. So I decided at that time to actually uh, build an application that could help us collect and identify leading external drivers of a very diverse global manufacturing company. And I think um, slide wise is kind of misbehaving. So I'm going to start again on the uh, slide control. But if you can't see it, I'll, I'll talk to it. But the, the real problem that we solve and, and how we do it is giving companies the ability to look beyond their four walls and use external data as easily and readily as they do internal data. And then to apply advanced analytics or predictive analytics to, to really combine their internal knowledge with this external insights, these external leading drivers, to build a more accurate forecast of demand uh, for their products and services. So this is a an API cloud-based add-on to your existing planning tools, whether it's demand forecasting, revenue forecasting, sales categories, brands, or products, we can find those right leading drivers and build a more holistic model, not one that just looks internally, but one that also has an external lens and then is always on, that can watch the world as it's changing every day um, and identify any market risk or opportunity ahead of time. So think of this as an army of data scientists or an army of economists even in a box that are constantly watching for these signals, whether it's supply chain disruption and imports and exports, health conditions like the pandemic, um, or it could be you know, microeconomic factors or macro or climate change that are actually leading signals of change coming to your business in different markets or different regions. And we can give you that advance notice so that if there is something that's either an opportunity or risk, you know and, and can take action to meet that opportunity or risk. Who we work with, a lot of times in manufacturing, it's certainly uh, demand forecasting and supply chain. So we've got a, a lot of customers and some of the leading manufacturing companies in the world, across petrochemicals, industrial packaging, others that will work to help in demand forecasting. But this also is very important. And somebody that's usually left out is kind of that executive team, the C-suite. The Office of Finance is, is one of the largest consumers of our solution as well. And that they need a grounded starting point so that when the business does come to them with a forecast, they have some unbiased lens that they can use to help you know, identify if there's a gap or a, a difference that the market is telling them in that forecast. And then companies that we work for, you know, they're, they're the top companies across about every industry, uh, but manufacturing, CPG, retail, uh, we have insurance, financial services. This is a problem everywhere. And what we've seen with the pandemic is really it, it has been a catalyst to companies to improve the way they forecast and plan and to start really modernizing a 20, 30 year old planning process with AI, with global data, and really a cloud-based technology that can do things that, as the, the speakers talked before this mentioned, that the routine and mundane things that they really don't have the horsepower to do in a timely manner internal anymore. So from that, I, I'm happy if there's, there's any questions or that'd be the end of my, my presentation. team. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to, uh, and great. Yeah, thank you to M12 and thanks to everybody in attendance today. Uh, my name is Larry Klemchuk. I'm the global lead of technology partnerships at uh, Farai. And uh, as you can see, probably from uh, my background, uh, we uh, have uh, just uh, done another fundraise and thank you very much for obviously M12's uh, support on that and we continue to kind of strengthen ourselves uh, financially. Um, what I'm hoping to uh, talk about today is something that's very topical and relates back to some of the, um, uh, the panel discussions earlier and that's visibility um, and the challenges 
that organizations have had, certainly in this in these pandemic times, of getting visibility across their supply chains and how that affects uh, manufacturers. Um, the four areas that we, as a solution, help organizations in are certainly in avoiding penalties, uh, optimizing inventory, and improving their transportation network and increasing their revenues. I'll uh, pull out a few of the items that are down below and, and then my uh, in, in this short 10 minutes, explain to you how we end up addressing some of those. In that penalties area, and you know, it seems like it's become a multi-billion dollar business for, uh, for some retailers, et cetera, is uh, these OTIF on time in full penalties. And we certainly help organizations in dramatically reducing those. We also reduce costs uh, or penalties in uh, time spent in saving shipments. You know, when something's gone wrong and then there's some sort of potential penalty that occurs, um, how can we end up avoiding that and avoiding those? In optimizing inventory, uh, if we can op if we can get real visibility across your supply chain, uh, both inbound visibility and outbound visibility, then we can reduce your carrying costs of your inventory. And also that obviously helps reduce your labor costs as well. Um, everything that we do is around predictability of goods in transit, so we can improve those planned transportation modes and obviously on-time performance. At the end of the day, our aim is what we're looking to do is to both lower your costs while increasing your customer experience and that customer experience is then going to lead to increased revenues for you so when we're speaking with um, manufacturers really the two key areas that uh, are coming up consistently are inbound visibility how do i get better inbound visibility of my raw resources and number two that's become very, very topical, certainly in the last 18 months, has been how can I also turn my business into a omni-channel business and therefore go D to C direct to consumer fulfillment? Let me move forward on our slides. And uh, when we're out in that marketplace, you know, what the chat we're seeing a few different things in this operational inefficiencies and how can we give more light to, to that uh, you know, visi and visibility into that black box that uh, people are calling out there. So the challenges that we see is, A, as I mentioned earlier, that lack of inbound visibility. And how do I actually control that customer experience at the time of delivery? So the ideal solution really is to improve that ETA accuracy, that expected time of arrival accuracy, and doing that through all kinds of stakeholder collaboration. And that's going to end up uh, ultimately improving the final consumer delivery experience. So the outcomes that uh, the market's asking us for is reduced turnaround times, improved visibility, customer happiness increase, and by doing, uh, by doing all of those, hopefully reducing costs. So who is Farai? Um, Farai, we're a, we're a low-code intelligent delivery management platform. We leverage literally millions of data points every day to predict a journey and then to improve that delivery experience. So when we talk about customer experience, the things that we assist in are certainly offering flexibility and visibility to the customer, essentially giving that Amazon-like visibility to a manufacturer and out to your customers. We also assist in delivery uh, scheduling. So can we help you give your customers the choice of when do they want to have things delivered? And finally, giving that visibility and then um, get allowing your customers to also rank their end experience. Um, early in the, in the panel discussion, there was a lot of discussion about AI and edge technology, and that's really all about FARI. Um, FARI, as you can see here, we interface with all kinds of additional organizations. Um, we'll take jobs in from a Microsoft three, uh, Dynamics 365 or an Oracle, um, OTM, SAP, et cetera. And then on that edge side is where we're getting the information from real-time sensors 
And then what we're doing is we're giving visibility and management throughout all of the um, transport processes that you see on the right hand side. And that's where we can then affect a better level of service while reducing costs for our customers. We obviously work very, very, we're, we're a SaaS solution, sorry, and we work very closely with Microsoft Azure. And that gives our customers cost control, but it also has a very strong partnership. And I just mentioned one of those partners in here, but also on the previous slide, how we interface with many, many uh, existing ERP, TMS, WMS systems. And we have a user-based licensing system or a transaction-based licensing system that can help you uh, um, grow as your business ends up growing. I'd like to finish off with two customer success stories because I think that probably always kind of brings it home for everybody. And these are two very large manufacturers. Um, the first one is Hilti. Um, Hilti was really challenged with how can they provide a better customer experience, i.e. give their customers or empower their customers with the visibility of when things are going to, um, I'm sorry, I, I think my slides aren't moving. Um, somebody maybe could uh, help me from a technology point of view. I, we should be on slide 36. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Hilti wanted to give their customers better visibility of when the Hilti products are actually going to be arriving. Um, and so we, we enabled our system to do that. And not only did Hilti then get better visibility of, of what's happening with their logistics operations, but more importantly, their customers were. So the end uh, results on all of this, Hilti got a 6% increase in OTIF compliance, on time and full compliance. And while 6% might seem like a, a, a small number, um, that, that's actually a, a massive uh, result that then leads to better customer satisfaction, reduction of penalties that we might have been talking about earlier, reduction of additional costs. And one of the areas of the reduction of costs is by giving that visibility directly to their end customer, there was a 30% reduction in customer calls. So not only is it reducing costs for Hilti, but it's reducing costs for their customers and increasing that customer satisfaction, which then leads to additional revenues. Another customer use case that I'd like to uh, share with you is Tata Steel. And again, I think for some reason the, the slides aren't <clears throat> moving. Uh, there they are now. Thank you very much. So with Tata Steel, um, unlike Hilti, where they were really focusing more on getting out to their customer, Tata Steel was looking at their inbound visibility. And how could we, how could they get better visibility from their suppliers into their plants? And by implementing FARI, um, they were able to reduce, well, some pretty, pretty key statistics here. Number one, 32% reduction in turnaround time. So having great visibility of what's coming in and when it's coming in, in, in real time, they were then able to reduce that whole turnaround time. The second area is a 57% reduction in transit risks. And what we meant by transit risk, this could be things like not making deliveries on time. It could also be pilferage. Um, and it could be other issues that they might have had with their transport organizations. So giving that overall arching visibility was incredibly important to Tata Steel. Um, in the deck that you'll, uh, you'll get from us, you're, there's been several other use cases and would welcome the opportunity certainly to have a further discussion. I think in summary, what we're here to help uh, manufacturers with is two areas. Number one, how can we give you better inbound visibility to reduce costs, avoid penalties? And how can we assist you in your move to becoming an omni-channel organization and making more and more deliveries directly to your end customer, that D2C area? So thank you very much for your time. And certainly if there's any questions, we'd uh, love, to, uh, love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. This is Tanya. We actually did have a question from the audience asking if you could provide a bit more information on the IoT sensor relationships you have, or is that through the carriers? Oh, that's, uh, that's a great question. So we are a software player and we're not a hardware player, but we interface with all kinds of different IoT devices. So that could be something like a GPS tracking device. It could end up being a, a temperature sensor. 
Um, it could be move, uh, um, interfacing with ELD devices here in the U.S., which are on most uh, long-range trucking. Um, so all of those types of sensors are things where we're taking that data feed in, then combining that with additional information such as potentially traffic, weather, uh, prior experience, um, try, 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 excuse me, prior um, lane segment performance, and then giving that customer back a excellent uh, predictive ETA. Excellent. I hope that answers Thank your question. Thank you. <laughs> I believe it does. Um, the person who <laughs> asked the question, if you want to learn more, go visit www.getfari.com or you can email talk to us at getfari.com. All right. And Thank with you. that, we are on to our next uh, startup presentation that will be with Mark Wittenberg, the account executive for Rescale. So, Mark, please take it away. Hey, thanks. Can everybody see my slides? I don't see my slides being shared. Not yet. Okay. I think there's a team. All right, there oh, we there go. they are. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go. No worries. No worries. Well, listen, uh, thanks for inviting Rescale to present today. Um, I'm excited to talk about how you can enable your IT engineering and R&D teams to move faster and turn and in turn like create better products in less time. Um, we deal with a really technical area. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what high-performance computing is, or let alone why you might think it's important. So bear with me. I'm just going to set the stage a little bit um, so that the rest of the presentation makes more sense. So you know, all of your companies have engineers and scientists who are trying to solve really complex problems, right? In the olden days, they like you know, pull up their CAD, and they design a product, and they take that, and they build a prototype, they go test that, and invariably it need to get improved, so they back to the drawing board, and that just took a lot of time and money, right? Um, enter simulation software. Now you can easily test the different parameters of every aspect of your product, um, and then uh, you wouldn't have to be spending a lot of money on getting to that prototype area. It's just a huge time savings. However, simulation software is really expensive. So what companies did was they would buy a pool of licenses. Uh, everyone had to share, right? You check in and you check out. Um, the faster a person gets done with their work, the sooner they can free up that license for the next person. That way they're not twiddling their thumbs. Um, but they're running that software on their workstation, right? And think about that, it's really slow. And so people were still waiting for software. To solve that problem, companies then bought really large, dedicated hardware clusters to speed the time to answer and get more work done. But the work, complex, the work requests get more complex and hardware couldn't keep up with the pace of technology and companies were kind of back to where they started. Hardware was the bottleneck. So HPC is really about optimizing three things, right? Talent, engineering and scientists, software and hardware. So with that as a background, uh, Rescale was really born out of necessity. Uh, we were you know, started by two engineers who were working for Boeing on the Dreamliner, and they were tired of coming into work on the weekends um, because that's when they had access to the hardware and software that they needed to get their jobs done. They just knew there had to be a better way. So over the last 10 years, Rescale's really worked hard to optimize those three components, right? How do we get our talent more productive? How do we get faster turns that are really expensive software? And how do we reduce the bottlenecks that hardware takes um, or you know, the pinch point that hardware has? And so at Rescale, what we do is we've got a platform that automatically provisions just the right cloud hardware because one size does not fit all, uh, just the right amount of hardware. So you have that elasticity because you're gonna need that. And we assign the right software that helps you accelerate that work, right? So that's really the background, and hopefully the, the next slides um, make more sense here. So let me wait for a second to pull this up. There we go. So um, if you're old like me, this is one of the more iconic scenes in television, and it really illustrates, I think, the power of Rescale. So you know the world is changing. The rate of innovation is just staggering. Your engineering and R&D departments are really you know, struggling to have to keep up. Um, and initially you could keep up because you had this brand new hardware cluster, you had the latest and greatest hardware. Um, but as the, as the years go by, the demands increase, the hardware can't keep up. And really engineers and, and uh, scientists have a choice to make. Do I test this under several parameters and really optimize my product? 
or do I just settle for good enough, right? And you'd be surprised at how often good enough is the path that's most chosen. The problem with good enough is you end up with missed product deadlines, engineering wait times, you have wasteful spending, and higher error rates. And so what people fail to realize is there a better way to assemble all of those different piece parts. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So high performance computing. At Rescale, we really like to think about like how do we help our customers become high performance manufacturing companies? And really there are three categories. There are the table stakes, how do we create advantages, and how do we take advantage of those game changers? Um, the good news is you can start anywhere on this horizon and Rescale can take you where you want to go. You know, the table stakes are just the building blocks. It's where most companies, frankly, fail. They never get to the other two columns. So if you're too busy keeping the lights on, you don't have the ability to use things like reinforced learning for Microsoft Project Bonsai. You know, if you're not familiar with Project Bonsai, ask your Microsoft rep. And I don't sell for Microsoft, um, but ask your your Microsoft rep to introduce you to the Project Bonsai team. I think you'll be amazed. But the whole point is you have to have an agile infrastructure so that you can take advantage of all of these game changing technologies in the right hand column, right? Everybody at the bottom that you see um, is some, some who's who of companies there. But those companies at the bottom have learned is how do we maximize HPC productivity? Again, how do we get our talent, software, and hardware? And you're going to hear me say that often. Uh, during this presentation, because those are the three components of high performance computing. So how do we get these companies really humming along and um, using Rescale that drives innovation and creates brand loyalty and that increases revenue and profits, right? So HPC is not a simple task. In fact, it's, it's really complex. Um, now, you can do this on your own. We could just fire up an Azure instance um, and you can certainly do that, but you could also turn your car and make it into a hybrid. Uh, you can do it. You need a lot of expertise and a lot of knowledge. And even if you're smart enough to do it, you have to ask yourself, is that really the best use of my time, right? It's, it's really complex. All of the things you see on the left-hand side are things that you have to take care of. Rescale shields our customers from all of that complexity that you're seeing. And we offload all of those operations of HPC. So your IT department, your R&D department, your engineering teams could all focus on high value activities. Rescale is this managed service, which means you know we're 100% turnkey. Think of us as that, that, um, that easy button in Office Depot that you just push. We give you the framework to enforce those best practices, which then leads to fewer errors. I don't think any IT department is really equipped to do that. One example I'd like to mention is a customer that we've got um, who actually needed to reduce their product liability. And so by using Rescale, they were able to save $1.8 million in warranty liabilities because we provided them with that framework and those tools to ensure optimal product design. And by ensuring product design, they're having fewer defects, fewer recalls. Um, and so I think the value is, is certainly there from a, how do we really make this hum along? So moving on to the next slide, I'm just waiting for that to load here. There we go. So what you're taking a look at is now that we've kind of established why, you know, the hardware is the bottleneck, software you don't get enough turns at and it's really expensive and your talent needs to be really productive. So, so that's the why rescale, but let's talk about how we get there. This is an entire platform. So what you're seeing is the best in class software with the best in class hardware and all of the things in the middle that make it work really smoothly. So we port and tune and maintain like 600 ISV tools, all of the software that you see at the top. And frankly, if, if you've got custom software and it's not on our list, we can onload it into Rescale at no additional cost. So we give you all of the necessary controls to make sure that you're getting the lowest cost of engineering. We give you these out of the box dashboards for full transparency into you know, who's doing what, how long it's taking them to do it, what it costs them. Uh, we've got this thing like a performance dashboard. So your engineers will get recommendation on what's the most cost effective hardware and what's gonna get the job done for this specific run that you need to make for this design. You're all, if you're running on premise, like 
you don't have any of those choices. And so you're stuck like wasting time and money. That's really the value of the cloud. And the value of Rescale is the orchestration part. All of that stuff in the middle that IT is burdened with keeping um, up to date, they no longer have to take those tasks on. So how do our customers use Rescale? In one of two ways. So they either augment their on-premise hardware, like we've got a customer who in January of 2019 bought a thousand core cluster. Now that's a big machine, right? And um, a year later in January of 2020, they started to, to run on Rescale. And you're like, well, you just bought a brand new cluster. Well, guess what? Requirements changed and they needed to run multiple GPUs and their on-premise systems just couldn't do it. They had no idea on what the future was going to bring them. But with Rescale, they're able to um, take advantage of all sorts of flexible core types and it, um, the elasticity of the cloud to get their jobs done. So that's one way, they augment their on-premise hardware with Rescale. The second way, and what we see a lot of is, there's a lot of aging hardware out there. Um, and so they use us, instead of buying more on-premise, they come to Rescale. Uh, another customer example was planning, um, uh, customers plan on buying like a 2000 core cluster. Uh, all in, that's probably about a $3 million price tag. That's a lot of money. Instead of doing that, what they did was they worked with us to split the workloads. So some of it had to stay on premise for legal, regula legal regulations, but the rest of it, they could move to cloud. The end result was Rescale saved them about $1.2 million in capital expenditure. And then here's the kicker. And thanks to Azure, this company, Microsoft, we're able to provision like the latest AMD hardware, not the second generation hardware that they were already planning on ordering for their on-premise. Uh, so we gave them, uh, just to kind of recap, we gave them faster hardware at less expensive price. And Azure's coming out with new core types and onloading it onto their platform and that we take advantage of about quarterly. So core types are always going to be faster and less expensive, not slower and more expensive. All the more reason to take advantage of Rescale because you want to get your work done quickly. So let me just kind of summarize some of the value points that we've talked today. Um, you don't want any wait times. Continuous innovation means making sure that your talent stays productive. You're never waiting on hardware. You're never waiting on software. Everybody is humming along. You need this flexible and agile infrastructure so you're able to scale up and down and not worry that you've like over or under invested in capital because both waste money. Rescale is this intelligent platform. We're always optimizing and fine tuning uh, all of the components, leaving your IT staff to do more important things. And frankly, your engineers and scientists can be more productive because they've got the tools that they need to be productive. Uh, we are turnkey, right? So you can build a car in 400 easy steps because you can assemble all of these piece parts and put it together. But why would you do that like, when you could just go buy a car it's like walking into a rental car facility and you got a, you got a family, you got six kids, right? You're going to pick out the minivan. That's the right vehicle for the right time. You know, if you're on a vacation and it's just you, you want the drop top, you want the wind in your hair, of which I don't have any, right? You're going to pay for a different vehicle that fits your needs right then. Guess what? I don't have to do any of the maintenance. I don't have to buy the insurance. All I have to do is use the vehicle, make sure that I fill it up with gas and return it. So, um, and lastly, I, I can't forget, like, you know, trust is our number one priorities, priority. So you, we never see your data, nor does anybody else. Um, so those are just some of the value points that we've got. There's one more slide in here. Um, so there we go. So th there it is. Um, and so as I wrap up, this is really a challenge to all of you is you've got customers. They're your engineering and R&D teams. And there's a new way of serving your engineering and R&D teams. It means being bold, it means taking risk, it means maybe trying something that's out of your comfort zone. Um, but you can get started easily. So if you wanna get started, just send an email to max, M-A-X, at rescale.com. We could do a discovery, we'll pick a workflow, we'll benchmark the as is, we'll compare that with versus the to be and decide how to proceed after that. Um, and let me just say, you've got like, everything to gain and nothing to lose by working with Rescale and Azure. Um, and with that, that's all I've got. Happy to take questions. I know we don't have time for it. Go check us out at rescale.com or again, max at rescale.com. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um,
feel like we should note that that does not constitute an endorsement by Albert Einstein, but we love the quote anyway. <laughs> we'll be moving on. I appreciate the passion there, and it's awesome to see how Rescale has been really scaling and helping major organizations and streamline their R&D. Um, we have up next Weeby, which will be uh, presented by Cecilia Flores, the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder. Hi, Cecilia. Nice to see you again. Hi, nice seeing you. Can you hear me well? Yes, right. of course. Go for it. So is, is my presentation already up or I cannot see it? Okay. I it is All right. Coming. There it is. There you go. Excellent. Thanks for, for having us and letting us present our company today. It's, it's, an, it's a pleasure for us. So Weeby is an industrial IoT and AI company. Uh, what we build is an uncode tool set for industrial manufacturing to help organizations quickly obtain real-time insights. And there's a couple of components here that are key, which is the non-code component of it, which is a platform that really doesn't let, uh, doesn't uh, require any type of coding um, throughout the whole process. And then also the ability to obtain um, real-time insights in a very fast way. You'll see now later on um, why. So um, our product really was built by working with the enterprises and understanding what were the challenges they were facing uh, to really move projects from POC into production line. Um, we worked for many years to really try to understand what were the much more um, uh, uh, inefficiencies they were having or the bottlenecks um, while trying to deploy solutions. And that's how the, the, the project uh, and the product came to life. So some of the challenges we are addressing, the extensive amount of manual controls in production line uh, that leads to human errors, the lack of visibility in uh, legacy machines, the delayed in problem detection in a, that causes inefficiencies and losses, and like I said before, the complexity of deploying IoT solutions, which really requires a multiple set of skill sets to get a solution up and running. So uh, what we did at Weavy is we came up with a solution, if you can move to the next slide, uh, we came up with a solution that really it's, uh, its goal is to accelerate this process. So uh, a couple of components, uh, all, all the way from the first step, which is how do we collect the data? Our platform is already integrated with more than 700 uh, devices, uh, sensors, non-intrusive sensors, and also connect to other external data sources that exist in the production line or in the manufacturing environment. Once that information is collected and put it at disposal, into our virtual canvas, then users can start creating workflows, conditional, setting up alerts or setting up recommendations in a drag and drop environment. This really means that we are giving them the power to do this without having or needing to understand any complexity in the IoT technology or have technical expertise or really need, need uh, really uh, they don't need to know any lang uh, programming language or require specialized engineering. Once they have you know, the flexibility to create their workflows, then it comes the last step, which is how do, you, do they visualize that information? How do they create applications and dashboards uh, to get uh, the, the information they need at the time they need it? All of this process can be done uh, without the need of, uh, of technical expertise. And the beauty of it is that uh, users can really simulate the scenarios and they can start uh, playing around and manipulating the information in a very agile way to make sure they have the solution up and running before they, they scale into production. So uh, if you move to the next slide, the, what we envision really is um, giving the users the possibility of connecting different data sources. So we have either, it, if, either if it is legacy machine through non-intrusive sensors, removing pa paper-based processes, or connecting to the PLC or any uh, management software, all that information gets into this virtual canvas that is filled with the idea in mind to give the power to the shop floor. So really getting the workers that know exactly how to solve those issues and the, uh, the, that are the, the knows that know the problem very much in detail, giving them the, the, the possibility of being part of building up those solutions for, for those specific uh, challenges in production. So uh, also the legacy machine part, we connect with different multiple uh, type of sensors that can give any type of ac accuracy and information they need, contextual information they need to have um, the application deployed and the information they need to see. So once that information is normalized and they have the ability to, in a very flexible way, to manipulate that information, they can create the type of application, exactly the type of application they need, whether it is for predictive maintenance or machine health, anything they need in the same platform in a very agile way. And then also the information can be um, 
created for multiple users within the organization, dependent on who within the organization needs to, to access that information is the type of, of, of reporting or panel uh, or information they will be accessing. So to make the process a little bit easier, we also uh, created pre-built applications, which are uh, pre-customized uh, pre applications that guide the user through how can they make the better use of the data they already have or the data they, they are already accessing through the platform. So these pre-built applications could be uh, production of throughput monitoring, predictive maintenance or facility and energy uh, monitoring. So these pre-built modules really make it easy and they also have artificial intelligence algorithm already embedded in the platform so that we make the process even easier. So uh, I brought a couple of use cases to share today. So if you move to the next slide, the first one is um, a motor brake prevention uh, use case, which is essentially uh, a retrofit of existing legacy machine um, legacy machines with non-intrusive sensors. So the beauty of this use case is that the whole process, through uh, all the way through onboarding the sensor to developing and, and having access to a um, uh, uh, monitoring uh, a dashboard and alerts, everything has been done in 30 minutes. So the sensor, we started with the, uh, integrating the sensor, which is a sushi sensor, it uh, uh, measures temperature, vibration, uh, velocity in the motor, which was the end goal for the user. Um, we, they recognize it and attach it to an asset within the platform, and then they created the specific dashboard they wanted to see. This use case also has an algorithm that detects anomalies uh, with the functioning of the motor and can alert in real time. And the beauty of it, and one important thing of this use case is also that uh, these, the locations where these motors are uh, located are very remote. So the whole process and the whole system can be accessed to the by the frontline workers that are actually handling those, uh, those machines without having to wait or, or you know, put a maintenance task and wait weeks to get uh, something uh, fixed to avoid downtime. So, if you move to the next slide, another use case is on production monitoring. This is a standard beverage production line. Uh, the challenge that the client have is that they have someone really walking down the line, understanding what a bottleneck happened. So they need to prevent inefficiencies and these bottlenecks to prevent downtime, uh, but they didn't have access to all the information they needed to see. So what we did is we, uh, uh, through non-intrusive sensors, we integrated some legacy machines and we also uh, integrated automated PL um, PLCs that were already working in the production line, consolidated all the information on a dashboard that they can access through their cell phone. So right now, every worker uh, that is uh, managing any step of this process have access through real-time monitoring in their cell phones. And also the beauty of this is that the whole process was implemented in a very um, agile way and that the workers were the ones that were actually taking a very proactive uh, uh, role in setting up the alerts that they need to see and they always can come, go back to the canvas and change anything in real time. So another use case that I brought to share today, if we move to the next slide, is on machine health monitoring. So this one uh, is an implementation for a client for a mixer, uh, which is the heart of the production for this client. So what we did with this uh, specific use case is eliminate a process that was done manually. So they have someone actually visiting the plant twice a month with a very high, sco high cost to really measure the vibration and some variables, energy consumption, vibration, temperature on the mixer. So what we did is re we replaced that with non-intrusive sensors and get accurate information in real time. And also we set up the predictive um, maintenance through um, artificial intelligence and some algorithms that can discover anomalies in real time. So we basically eliminated this manual control in a couple of days just having everything up and running for, for the client. And now they can also not only detect anomalies and prevent any inefficiencies, but they can also create maintenance tasks through the same platform. So they automated multiple processes with one end-to-end no-code solution. So moving to the next slide, just to recap some of the work we're doing with our clients and partners. So we have solutions deployed in different business verticals with clients such as Panasonic, with whom we monitor air quality condition, or Spirax Arco, with whom we monitor um, industrial boilers to have accuracy on the status of the boilers in real time and also um, have an understanding of anomaly detection as well. And they offer this solution to all of their clients um, as an add-on in how, do, how they can retrofit the existing infrastructure and add intelligence to it. And, and also some of the uh, agricultural processes with some of our clients. 
in, the, in, in different regions. So we have a very strong partnership also with Microsoft, with whom we work not only on the technological side to have the most potential of the Azure platform with our tool set, but also on the Microsoft for Startup program. And I think it was mentioned before, we were uh, winners of the female founder competition last year, which is an enorm uh, enormous proud, uh, pride for our company. And then we were also recognized as a world changing idea by Fast Company earlier this year. So that's what, we, what I um, brought to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. So glad to have you part of the M12 family. Uh, I think at this point, we're going to move over to the presentation by Wandelbots, led by Annette Diaz, the head of business development. Annette? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Annette, and I would like to pick up the topic Cecilia just started to present, and that is no code. In our case, we're talking about how we could help you unleash your robots flexibility and that with no code robotics. I am based in Dresden in Germany. Wandelbots has 125 people working for them, and the purpose all of those people share is that we want to make robotics available for everyone in the world. And that means that we thought, what is it actually that is the challenge right now to make any human in the world communicate with robots? And that's the language. And the fact that all the robots out there are based on heterogeneous solutions, languages, operating systems. They don't communicate very well with each other. And that makes it naturally very expensive for a company to program and reprogram robots in a production line. It also makes it very slow. Very often you have to use system integrators that work with your company in order to do that job. Um, they have speci special safety qualifications and similar things in place. That alone costs a lot of money. And of course, the whole topic is very complex. Um, that means it's very hard to find uh, experts in that area. And most of those robots, if you really go down onto the shop floor and, and look at the robots, no matter if that is a Kuga, Jaskava, and ABB, of course, they are very mysterious, advanced technologies. But very often, um, what you really see down there is partly technology from the 80s. So not even connected to cloud yet and uh, not even sending or receiving any data. And that is something we took as a, as a challenge. And um, I want to share a two minute video with you. So grab some popcorn and then maybe you understand why there is such a hype around Bundlebot since October, since we launched our trace pen. We have a vision. Any given robot application, directly set up by the user. Intuitive, easy, and at unrivaled speed. The revolutionary trace pen makes it possible now. To use it is unbeatably simple. The user places the wireless trace pen in a mount on the robot arm and starts the calibration. He then pairs the trace pen with the tool and performs the desired application as usual. The sensors of the trace pen detect both the free movement paths in the room, such as adhesive and weld seams as well as point-to-point -point applications such as screws, pick and place or spot welding. The trace pen software calculates the program code in the shortest possible time, which ultimately implements the taut application and programs the entire event control. The robot communicates directly with the PLC and starts the application. teaching plus implementing as a fully integrated solution for automation, ready to use. No complex planning, no conventional programming, easy for everyone to use. Automation has never been so fast. Compared to conventional programming, users only need a fraction of the time to use robots with the trace pen. Make robot cells much faster to use and with the extreme short conversion time, make production even more flexible than ever before. 
with its revolutionary properties, the trace pen opens almost limitless possibilities for all industrial applications and industries and can be applied to almost all processes. The trace pen software works system independently with all robot models from all manufacturers worldwide. The trace pen product package provides everything that is needed for the job. If required, it also includes a separate industrial PC independent of the robot manufacturer. Agile robot planning without experts. Trace pen, smart automation for everyone. So the first thought was, of course, to enable anyone, not just experts, to teach robots to execute on certain movements, be that welding or gluing or painting or whatever, the sky is the limit. And um, what that brings your company, just to pick up on what I said before, is a cost saving that in some cases we proved up to 90% of total cost of ownership. So I, I didn't bring too many use cases today, but I'll tell you a few of them. Um, we, for example, proved uh, at BMW in a windshield gluing project that we could speed up the programming and reprogramming of the robot up to 70 times faster than it was before. Um, also, the goal is, of course, to, to put our operating system, it's called Wandel OS, and that's a robot agnostic platform, to put that on any robot in order to allow them to talk to each other and then to also connect them through, for example, Microsoft into the cloud. And um, I want to use a, an analogy that Satya Nadella used. I really love it. He played with a trace pen. He was based in Seattle and actually taught a robot here in Dresden to execute on a certain action. And then he said, this is great. This is like the mouse and the operating system you guys developed is like Windows 10 just for robots. And that is a perfect picture of where we are heading and the trace pen is just the entrance point to that. And that is this platform I mentioned. It's a robot agnostic platform we're building together with the industry, basically as other platforms as well, building a true ecosystem of, for example, the robot manufacturers, the, the people who, who built the grippers, the PLCs, all the other sensors involved and uh, the cloud manufacturers. And there, of course, Microsoft is our key player to then reach a next level, and that is to help you actually get your production to move it into the 21st century, to really speed up that production, go away from the left side of the picture you see here, and that is siloed robots. Preferably, you have to go with a USB stick to play a software update on them. That, that should be passed. We want to move over to a world where all the robots are connected with each other, factories are connected with each other, all of them are connected into, for example, Microsoft Azure to then be able to put smart services on top like a robot fleet manager, which you can find, by the way, in the Azure App Store. There's a one robot fleet manager, but also to put other services on top like imagine you could use a skill from one robot that is gluing something in a Volkswagen plant in Wolfsburg and move it over to a plant in America and let that robot on the same part do the same activity. Imagine the efficiency increase and the cost savings you can have there. So with that, I just want to give you a vision of what robotics could be about and what it means for us to democratize robotics. And I want to say thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out or find us on wandlebots.com. Thank you so much, Annette. Fantastic video, too. I hadn't seen that one. <laughs> um, all right. And we will now welcome Greta Kutulenko, who is the CEO and co-founder of Acerta. Acerta is also a female founders winner from our first iteration of the competition. Um, and Greta, we're just so excited about how you've grown the company and where you're headed next. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Tanya. And hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. Um, my name is uh, Greta Kutolenko, and I'm CEO and co-founder of um, Acerta Analytics. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what Asserta does, but we're a um, company that uh, have been now growing since 2017, uh, are a bit over 40 people at the moment, um, and really focusing in bringing um, explainability into the product data that's being generated and created within the automotive industry. So I'll talk a little bit about what we do, but really our goal um, as a company is to um, empower manufacturers with the data that's there being collected across uh, manufacturing and assembly processes in production, um, and then connect that product data with in-service um, operational information uh, to drive a lot of cost savings and improvement in how the data is being leveraged to ensure that uh, we're bringing efficiently uh, quality products uh, into the market. Um, so specifically, Asserta uh, offers uh, and works with manufacturers to leverage the data that's being already collected in many ways across their operations and um, through AI and machine learning uh, solutions, um, bring insights that can help detect issues downstream and um, be more predictive in operation. So specifically leading to uh, improved first time yield, improved scrap rates um, and reduction in potential quality spills so that manufacturers spend uh, less time and, and, and uh, lose less uh, uh, money on uh, warranty returns. So it really powers this uh, feedback loop um, across the product life cycle by leveraging the product data um, available today. So to show this a little bit more context of where we fit in, so, so Asserta um, is powers uh, applications on top of SCADA systems and MES systems, as well as by working on top of existing test systems within manufacturers' production plants. Um, we bring a lot of our expertise in understanding how manufacturing and automotive data behaves and how to uh, transform this data in order to start deriving the insights that can help move that data from being uh, this huge volume of information that's potentially not being leveraged to an, an explainable and impactful uh, source, of, um, source of direction for the manufacturers. And then our goal is to, uh, through our analytic solution, bring uh, an opportunity to get predictive and, and avoid uh, problems downstream. Um, and of course, to help manufacturers maintain and scale these. Um, as we know, over time, these solutions need to be um, need to continue to drive that value. So that's kind of where Serta sits. We offer a set of tools that support manufacturers in uh, managing these deployments, but also uh, solutions that help directly impact um, the, the the key metrics in manufacturing facilities uh, for the automakers. So to, to put that into a little bit more perspective and what we've accomplished, let me uh, talk through a little bit how we first, how we've been um, bringing some of this um, capability into uh, manufacturing facilities of um, an axle manufacturer. Uh, so, Asserta in, in our collaboration uh, with the manufacturer have been able to drive uh, over 40% scrap and rework reduction across now um, nearly 5 to 10 different facilities. Um, specifically, how we're doing with this is by leveraging the data that's being uh, generated and collected now across their operations through both MES and, and, and SCADA systems. We're combining data that spans um, dozens of different operations um, that are working on assembling uh, the axles. Um, first and foremost, by helping them um, monitoring and predict uh, anomalies in some of the operations and drift in those operations, we're able to help the manufacturer get ahead of problems that could impact the quality of the product downstream and could lead to uh, backlash issues. Um, on the axle. So we've been deployed across the board in these operations to provide real-time alerts, uh, provide them visibility into uh, what could go wrong and what could impact um, the production of, their, um, of these systems. 
Um, in addition, you know, to being a cloud-driven solution that can help them do this, we actually support um, edge-deployed models as well that more actively um, influence uh, their assembly process. Um, and in, in one of the cases, and in some of these uh, productions, we've been able to deploy a solution that can automatically um, support them in recommending subcomponents uh, that can be um, used during the assembly to ensure uh, a high quality and, and product. Um, and by combining those solutions, we've, we've been able to not just improve their scrap and rework rates, um, but also help create much more consistent throughput in, in their facilities and really, uh, you know, save time for the production engineers uh, such that instead of jumping into issues and dealing with rework and continuously having to, um, you know, react to these problems, um, really making their jobs easier and helping identify some of these problems before they start to impact production um, and helping pinpoint where some of these issues are originating. Now, that's kind of one example of how we've done this with an axle manufacturer. I want to also go into a little bit deeper how with a different production, with a different system. So for transmissions, for example, we're able to help actually reduce defect rates that were driving um, warranties for the manufacturer and reduce it by as much as 30%. So in that specific case, in addition to leveraging data from the subassembly, we've augmented uh, and are able to leverage the testing uh, data that the manufacturer is collecting um, for each transmission that's coming off the production line. So by leveraging the parts um, birth uh, history, in addition with this um, data collected during the testing, we're able to uh, um, analyze very, as you can see, a lot of data from these systems. So in this example, what you're seeing here, every squiggly line is a set of data, uh, data points that are time series data being collected during testing of these transmissions. So over 4,000 different um, um, uh, time plots uh, of the performance. So we're able to leverage all of this to really pinpoint um, new problems or, or defective operation, anomalous operation that happens within these systems. And that way actually get in front of potential, um, potential defects that could be released um, outside of the production uh, facility. Um, so by doing this, the manufacturer is able to get in front um, of um, potential quality spills, uh, really be able to respond to any kind of defects much faster and can even then go backwards to the production and, and operations um, and assembly processes uh, to identify downstream where some of the, the defects can be originating. So this really brings a lot more uh, efficient approaches and effective approaches to ensuring quality by leveraging this data and really helping explain this data rather than having it sit around and, um, and not be leveraged to impact um, the digital operations of the factory. So just to kind of summarize, so CERT has been, uh, we're, we're a globally operating company, so we've been working with a number of tier ones and OEMs in the automotive industry. And that combination of understanding of the manufacturing and automotive uh, landscape, as well as our strength of our solutions, we're able to um, leverage the data that you're already creating uh, in a way that can drive you value and impact and drive the cost savings in your operations. Um, now we work with a number of different systems. So axles, transmissions are just some of them, but any high precision systems, so from pumps uh, to batteries, um, is something that Asserta is able to support manufacturers in analyzing and um, optimizing the efficient operations um, of production. Um, some things I want to just leave off that for this future of digital manufacturing, a lot of this data can really help change how we're um, leveraging uh, the product data and how it's being used to optimize the, the manufacture of the products. Um, and, and that's really at the core of line pulse. We're helping explain the data that's already being collected so that it's not just, uh, so that it's actually driving value 
and we're deploying a lot of uh, these high value um, solutions on top of our platform. So things like I mentioned, intelligent component selection for complex assembly and anomaly detection that can drive defects, um, can find uh, and, and get ahead of, of defects. Um, so those are some cases and, and really what's the strength of our platform is that we've been able to deploy this scalably across multiple operations and facilities for customers and continuously uh, provide the results and impacts um, in a way that the performance doesn't deteriorate over time. So that platform approach is something we're looking to also bring to customers long term. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greta. We really appreciate your presentation today. And, you know, I know it's hard to encapsulate everything that Asserta does in just 10 minutes. So uh, that brings me to the next point of this, which is thank you all for joining us for the seminar today. We really hope you found it to be an informative, insightful session. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our companies, um, they have plenty more to share. Please go visit this link. It's HTTPS. Uh, aka.ms M12 Summit Survey, and a quick little form will come up for you to opt in and actually enter your inf a little bit of information about what you thought about the day, what we could do differently or better, and then if there's specific companies you'd like to meet with um, so that we can help you get connected. We would love to be able to facilitate that so you can learn more about their solutions and explore opportunities to collaborate. Other than that, I think we are at the close of our day. So again, thank you everyone for joining for today's webinar. We will have a blog and the video recap that should go up on Monday if you'd like to come back and revisit it or uh, share it with some of your colleagues. And other than that, you can always learn more about M12 at www.m12.vc. You can find us on LinkedIn and on Twitter at, at M12VC. But we hope you found today insightful. Um, I know my brain is full. And oh, last thing I definitely wanted to do was thank the incredible production team who made this all possible. So first of all, you know, Sammy Johnson, Leslie Teisling, Heine Gals, all the folks who from Run Studios, and then Hayden. Taylor from M12, who produced this event end to end. Um, Colleen O'Brien, our marketing lead, who has made all of our reband and M12 show up the way that we do, um, as well as our speakers. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, Samir, Robert, David, we appreciate your time and insights and the generous contribution and support you've made to making this event a success. Thank you. Take care and have a great rest of your June.